Go ahead. Thank you all for coming. Please be seated. Thanks for the warm reception. Ben, you always draw a good crowd. <laughs> he claims he went to this high school. I did, class of 62. Yeah. Pretty soon you'll be receiving a Social Security check. I, I, I hope so. I hope, I hope my son and my grandchildren will, too. Uh, listen, thank you all uh, for giving us a chance to come and visit with you about uh, Social Security. Um, before I begin, I do want to thank Lori Checo, who's the business manager at Montgomery Blair, Montgomery Blair High School. Thanks for letting us come by. I appreciate you opening this beautiful facility. I want to thank Mark Mackey and Linda Hollins, who are part of the National Retirement Planning Coalition, for uh, sponsoring this event. Uh, it's important that there be an open dialogue about Social Security, the problems uh, inherent with Social Security and the opportunities to fix Social Security. And that's why I've come today. So thank you all for sponsoring this. It's, uh, you know, some in Washington wished I hadn't have brought it up. They said, why would you bring up Social Security? I mean, after all, we might have to run for election. And why would you bring up such a difficult topic? And the answer is because I see a problem. And I believe my job is to address problems and not pass those problems on to future presidents, future congresses, or future generations. And here's why I see a problem. Before I describe the problem, I do want to congratulate one of my predecessors, Franklin Roosevelt, for doing something really smart and really wise, and that is setting up a safety net for retirees. Social Security has worked. And it's it's, been, a, it's been a very important part of a lot of people's lives. And the first thing I want to say to those who receive a Social Security check today, nothing changes for you. You're in good shape. The system is solvent for people receiving a check. The reason I say that is because I understand how politics works. You see, the surest way to stop something from going forward, to stop a dialogue, or stop reform if reform is needed, is to scare people. And in the past, people have used the Social Security issue to scare seniors. They say, oh, George W. gets elected, you're not going to get your check. Or if this goes through, you're not going to get your check. And that, you know, that's kind of shameless politics. And so I'm spending a lot of time not only describing the problem, but assuring seniors that no matter what the rhetoric is coming out of Washington, you are going to get your check. So you need to tell your grandparents they're going to get their checks. All of us, whether you're a Republican or a Democrat, know how important this program is to a lot of seniors around the country. The question is not whether the seniors will get their checks. The question is whether younger Americans uh, will be able to have a safety net, a retirement system just like today's generation gets. And here's why, the, the, why, why we have a problem. There's a lot of people like me getting ready to retire. <laughs> in my case, I re re reached retirement age in 2008, <laughs> which turns out to be a fairly convenient date. <laughs> get it? About 70 million plus of us are getting ready to retire. You're so old, you don't even qualify as a baby boomer. Thank you, Mr. No, don't worry about it. <laughs> There's now about 40 million retirees. Just, so you're going to get a sense of the problem. And there's a whole bunch of people are getting ready to retire, and we're living longer than the previous generation, and we've been promised greater benefits than the previous generation. And so you got a lot of people getting ready to retire who've been promised greater benefits. The problem we have is that there are fewer people paying into the system. In 1950, there were about 16 workers for every beneficiary. Today, there are 3.3 beneficiary uh, uh, workers for every beneficiary. Soon, there will be two workers for every beneficiary. You got a lot of people living longer, getting greater benefits with fewer people paying for us. And the system, as a result, starts going into the red when the baby boomer generation begins to retire. As a matter of fact, it starts going in the red in 2017. I know that sounds like a long time for people in Washington. It's not very long if you're entering the workplace. In other words, you're paying into a system that starts going broke in 2017 into the red. And every year thereafter, after 2017, the problem gets worse. 
In 2027, it's $200 billion in the hole. In the 2030s, it's $300 billion in the hole. See, Social Security is not a, 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 a trust. It's a pay-as-you-go system. You pay, and we go ahead and spend. You pay payroll taxes. You work hard. You put payroll taxes into the system, and the federal government spends your payroll taxes on, 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 on retirees, and with money left over, it goes for government programs. And all that's left is a file cabinet of IOUs. In other words, some think that we're taking your money and we're holding it for you and then we're going to give it back to you and you retire. That's not the way it works. It's a pay-as-you-go system. And the pay-as-you-go system starts going into the red. And it gets worse and worse and worse. As a matter of fact, every year we wait, it's going to cost us $600 billion to fix it. $600 billion a year to fix it. In other words, the longer we wait, the harder it is for me to be able to look at younger Americans and say, the money you're putting in the system is going to be there for you. Now, if you're older, you're going to get your check. If you're born prior to 1950, you're fine. If you're a younger American, you need to pay attention to this issue. I think this is a generational issue. Grandmothers and granddads have nothing to worry about. Their grandchildren have got a lot to worry about. My strategy has been to travel the country saying we've got a problem. I think pretty well most Americans now understand we do have a problem. And the reason I knew that was the first step that needed to be taken, because I have confidence that once people realize there's a problem, then they'll ask their elected representatives to do something about it. And I was pleased to see some members, uh, Republican members of the House and the Senate have started laying out ideas. I've been laying out ideas. I think it's time for the leadership in the Democrat Party to start laying out ideas. See, the American people expect those of us who've come to Washington, D.C. to negotiate in good faith on behalf of the people. If there's a problem, people ought to say, here's what I'm for, not what they're against. People ought to be willing to step up and lead as opposed to close the play in partisan politics. That's what the people want. And no matter, I believe future generations ought to receive benefits equal to or greater than the previous generation. I like the idea that had been put on the table by a Democrat economist named Posen. It's called progressive indexing. It says if you're the poorest of Americans or the lower income Americans, you get your benefits calculated by wage increase. If you're the richest Americans, top 1%, you get your benefits calculated by inflation, increase of inflation. In other words, everybody's benefits go up. The wealthier people's benefits will go up slower than the poor benefits. And in between, there's a scale. That's called progressive indexing. It basically says we can make a commitment to poor Americans that if you've worked all your life, you're not going to retire into poverty. I like that idea. I think that makes a lot of sense. This pro progressive indexing solves, permanently solves most of the problems in Social Security. It doesn't solve it all, but it, 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 takes, it, it, it permanently solves most of the problem. And there are other ideas on the table. I ask people to bring them forth. If you've got a good idea, step up with it. I'm more than willing to listen. What I'm not going to listen to is this partisan bickering in Washington, D.C. Pe you know, people, people really expect us to do different. They expect us to think differently and act differently when you see a problem, and we have a problem. I got another idea that we're going to discuss today. It's an idea that some feel uncomfortable about. I understand that. But I think it's certainly worth the dialogue. And that is, on the one hand, we ought to permanently solve uh, the, 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 the solvency issue for Social Security so that I can... We can, all of us involved in politics, look at younger workers and say, you're fixing to pay into a system that will not only take care of baby boomers like me, but there will be a retirement system for you. I also think we ought to make the system a better deal for younger workers, and that means giving younger workers the option, the ability, if they so choose, to take some of their own money, after all, it's your money in the payroll taxes, and set it aside in what we call a voluntary personal savings account. It's an opportunity... <laughs> Thank you.
I like the idea of giving somebody a chance to build a nest egg that the government can't spend. In other words, remember the What you have left in the Social Security system today is a file cabinet with IOUs in West Virginia. I actually went and saw the file cabinet, and I'm proud to report the papers there. <laughs> I like the idea of encouraging people to own assets that they get to manage. It's, it makes economic sense. If you're a younger worker and you realize that we're taking your money and we're putting it in a system that may not be around for you, you ought to demand change. But let me tell you what else we're doing. We're taking your money and putting us into a system that's yielding about a 1.8% return. That's a lousy deal. So I think you ought to be allowed to take some of your money, set it aside in a voluntary personal savings account so you can invest in bonds or stocks and bonds and stocks whatever you so choose you can't put it in the lottery by the way there'll be go buys in other words the government's going to say we're not going to let you take it to the track we're not going to let you we're not going to let you take wild risks there's there's a the, people do this all the time by the way and they get a better rate of return than 1.8 percent and if you can get a better rate of return of 1.8 percent it compounds over time and it's that compounding of interest that helps create wealth and security in retirement. The voluntary personal accounts will complement that which is available to you through the Social Security system. But you're going to get a better deal on your own money than in the current system. I like the idea of people having assets that they can pass on from one generation to the next. I reject this notion that the investor class is confined to only a certain group of people. I think investors ought to be around. And finally, I believe this idea ought to be debated because the system is not fair in this sense. If you're a, uh, if you're, if you're a spouse and, and your other spouse and your, and your, and your, if you're a husband and your wife works or your wife and your husband works and you're both contributing to the Social Security system, if one of you uh, dies early, if you die before 62, what you get is you get a, a, a burial benefit from the government. In other words, you've been working all your life. You're putting money in the Social Security system. Both of you have been. One of you dies early. And the government says, here, fine, here's a burial benefit. And then when you get retirement age, you get to choose. You get to choose the benefits of your spouse or your own benefits, whichever uh, might be higher. But you don't get both. Now think about that. So you get two folks contributing into the system. One dies early. And uh, by the time the survivor reaches retirement age, he or she gets to say, I either get my spouse's benefits or my benefits, but not both. In other words, one of the, 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 the deceased spouse has contributed to a system and the money just gone away. That's not fair. It's not fair to say to working people, work all your life, and the money you've contributed is not around if you happen to die early. It's not fair to your spouse. The spouse is not fair to the family. If we allow younger workers, if they so choose, to take some of their own money. And remember, I keep saying if they so choose, to take some of their own money and set it up in an asset that grows over time. If that were, if that were to happen, if somebody were to die early, at least there's an asset to pass on to help the spouse. See, the system is not fair today. It's not fair for younger workers to know it's going broke and you have to contribute into it. It's not fair for people who are living today who work in the system all their play into the system and there's not an asset upon, upon death, early death. It's just not right. And I think now's the time to get something done. By the way, the idea of voluntary personal savings accounts is not new. You're going to hear from some young investors. Investing is not new. It's new for older people. You know, when we grew up, there wasn't 401Ks. Or IRAs. These are relatively new concepts. I bet there was no 401ks when you grew up. You look like a baby boomer. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you're okay. You. Um, but the idea of, a, you know, saying if you work for the government, you can take some of your own money and put it aside in a voluntary personal savings account isn't new in Washington. I don't know if you know this or not, but the Federal Thrift Savings Plan, that's the plan that the Congress set up for themselves and people who work in the federal government says, if you want to, you can set aside some of your own money in a mix of bonds and stocks. And so my attitude is to folks uh, around the country is, if it's a good idea for congressmen and senators, in other words, if, it's, if they think it's a good enough, enough idea for themselves, it ought to be a good enough idea for workers all across the country. Anyway. 
I see a problem. I'm willing to talk about solutions. I'm looking forward to working with both Republicans and Democrats to get the job done. And I want to thank our panelists for joining us to help make uh, some very important points. So people, see, this is an education process we're going through. People have got to be educated. There's a lot of messages getting out there uh, on the TV screens. You know, people saying this and people saying that. Once people understand there's a problem, once the grandmothers and granddads understand they're going to get their check, they can relax, then they're going to start asking people who've been elected to office, what are you going to do about my grandkids? You don't have a grandkid yet, do you? Thank God. Our son is only 17. Well, that's good. <laughs> uh, you went to high school here? I went to Montgomery Blair High School, class of 62. Best uh, class ever. Really? That's yeah. awesome. Yeah. I'm, con I'm concerned about it. I'm just extremely concerned about it. I, 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 You've been I, talking about it for a while? I talk about it. I, I represent two groups. I represent the National Retirement Planning Coalition, which helps people plan for retirement. And I'm also representing for the gangsters all across the world, hidden corners in them Lolo's girl. But I, I, what I see is seven, uh, that's rap music, yeah. Mr. President. And uh, I, 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 see, uh, I see 78 million baby boomers racing towards retirement woefully unprepared, their, their savings outside Social Security are woefully inadequate, but at least they're going to get their Social Security. But for the group coming after that, their children and grandchildren, they're woefully unprepared in terms of their personal savings, and they're also woefully unprepared in terms of Social Security. What's got to happen is we've got to close the gap between rich and poor by letting everybody in this country get in on the investment side of things and harness their futures to the enormous engine of corporate America. And just the same as rich people get rich by buying stocks, let's let everybody get better off by buying stocks and by buying broad indexes of stocks. I don't think you're planning on saying to people, go out and pick individual stocks and pick internet stocks and so forth. The plan is going to involve broad indexes, broad categories of stocks that are going to be safe over the long period of time. They'll fluctuate from year to year, but over long periods of time, you're going to get a rate of return of 7, 8, 9 percent. That's four or five times better than the rate from Social Security. A person putting in $100 a month for 45 years is going to come out with about four or $500,000 just at minimum stock market returns. That's going to make an incredible difference in people's lives. People have got to get in on it, get in on retirement planning, and they've got to learn about financial literacy, Mr. President. Yeah. Too many young Americans don't know what a stock is, don't know what a bond is. Too many baby boomers don't know what a stock is, don't know what a bond is. They've got to be educated about what is a bond, what is a mutual fund, what is a stock, what is an exchange traded fund, what is a variable annuity, so that they can get in on the enormous profit machine that makes rich people rich. Let's make everybody rich by letting them get in on it. Let's not just confine it to the rich. Well, I'll tell you an interesting story. I was at an automobile plant in Mississippi. And I, there you go. He's from Mississippi. Yeah, okay, two of you. <laughs> and uh, I uh, was with the line workers, and I uh, said, uh, how many of you all have 401ks? In other words, how many of you are managing your own money? And I bet 90, I, I didn't count, but a lot, 90% of the hands went up. These are people from all walks of life, all income groups. It's amazing how quick you become financially literate when you're watching your own money. <laughs> In other words, but... Let, let, let's talk about financial literacy and let's talk about this notion of risk. And let's talk about whether or not, you know, a person who is nervous about stocks and bonds has the capacity to absorb all these fancy words you're well, talking about. Well, but they're not, they turn out not to be fancy words. I mean, it turns well, it sounds out, a, fancy. A, a, well, a stock, a, well, it isn't fancy. Well, okay. a, stock, <laughs> a, stock, a stock is a share in ownership of a corporation. A broad index of stocks is an, a share in hundreds, thousands of corporations. And the, the value of those investments will fluctuate from year to year, but over long periods of time, they will do incredibly well. I mean, uh, here's a statistic. I know you don't like statistics. No, I like them, yeah. but, but there's a, Particularly but, when they help make the but, point. But over any 20-year 20, 20 period in the last 100 years, a person who bought the broad index of the Standard & Poor's 500, the largest 500 corporation in America, would not have lost money, and his average return would have been 10 times his money. That's not, I mean, that is so much more than Social Security, it's insane. Over a 25-year period, the average return is more than 20 times as money, 
and there's been no 20-year period in the last 100 years when a stock market investor would have lost money. So there will be fluctuations from year to year, but over long periods of time, investors in stocks through mutual funds, exchange-traded funds, variable annuities, will come out way, way, way ahead of the game, wildly out of the game. A lot of people I hear, you know, when I uh, hear these people saying, well, all, all, all they want to do is let Wall Street get rich. They're already rich. Oh, <laughs> all right, richer. In other words, I think one of the things people have got to understand, and, and, and perhaps you can help on this one, is that there, there will be negotiated fees on behalf of the people. In other words, you're not going to get gouged. I think that's a convenient red herring. Yeah, that's a, the, the usual fees on these things, especially if you're a careful shopper, and especially under your plan, are going to be extremely minimal. The, I mean, the fees for, uh, for many of these things are close to zero, and Wall Street is not going to get rich off this. They're already rich. They don't need the money. The person who needs the money is a person Ben or Brian's age who, who is going to get in at, at the age of 20 or 21 or 22 or 25 and is going to let compound interest do all the heavy lifting for him. If you get in in your 20s, by the time you're in your 40s, you're set. If you have to compound start your, interest, some people may not know what that well, means. Well, compound interest means you, you earn interest and then you earn interest on the interest. And as, if you let that work for you in the stock market for 20, 30, 40 years, even if you're just putting a small amount away each month, you're going to have a much more comfortable retirement than you ever dreamed of having. If you start when you're in your 40s or 50s, the problem doesn't get solved. If you start when you're in your 20s, it does get solved. And that's sort of exactly what we're talking about with your social security plans. If we start now, it's going to be easy to solve the problem. If we wait till the system's already broke, it's going to be incredibly difficult and expensive to solve the problem. Why not do it now when it's easy? See, the idea is to say to younger workers, instead of putting money into a bankrupt system or a system that will be bankrupt, we're going to, one, permanently solve the problem, and two, give you a better deal by letting you watch your own money grow, investing in a safe mix of bonds and stocks that will compound over time. Wendy Merrill's with us. Should we, should we turn to Wendy? Yes, absolutely. Wendy, where are you from? Good morning. Thanks for having me. Where are you from? I'm from Reisterstown, Maryland. Reisterstown. Which is near good. Baltimore. Great. Thanks for coming over. Thank you. My pleasure. Um, I'm 32 years old. And you I don't have, look at a day over 21. Oh, huh? aren't you sweet? Thank you. <laughs> well, you know how we politicians I have two, are. <laughs> <laughs> I have two family members with me today. I wanted to say hi to my husband, Stephen, and my father, Neil, are in the audience with us good. today. Thanks for coming. Yeah. <laughs> say hello to him after the event. Yes. Good. Thank you. And um, I have been in the financial services business for 10 years. I'm an insurance broker. I work with my family's insurance agency. And I'm a big fan of these personal accounts. I think it's right. a great solution to the problem. Um, I am a member that I'm a little older than these guys over here, but I'm definitely a member of the generation that was taught that I couldn't count on Social Security for my retirement. For that reason, ever since I joined the workforce, I've been saving in 401ks and IRAs and really taking charge of my own future, which is what I advise my clients to do as well when we discuss retirement planning. I just tell them, you know, don't count on Social Security. Um, unless it gets fixed, of course. And um, so it's kind of sad, isn't it? Excuse me for interrupting. <laughs> you got younger Americans saying, don't count on Social Security. <laughs> now, I guess the word's getting out. Slowly but surely, we got a problem with Social Security to the point where you've got some people saying, don't count on it. As a matter of fact, I saw a survey where it said younger workers feel like they're more likely to see a UFO than get a Social Security <laughs> check. <laughs> Excuse me for interrupting. No problem. I, I agree. I mean, I, I just... So I, it's, blow, it, it's amazing that we sit here in Washington not getting anything <laughs> done, knowing that you got younger Americans not thinking they're going to see a check on Social Security. That's the wrong kind of politics. <laughs> Sorry, go ahead. I mean, I know it comes out of my paycheck, but I just figure that it's just going to go to pay for my parents' retirement and your retirement and everyone else's retirement. Um, so I, I think these personal accounts are a great idea because I think there's no problem with handing the responsibil financial responsibility to a younger generation to say, here, make some choices for yourself. Take charge of this. It's very similar to, because we were brought up in a 401k type of culture, and there's so much information out there that's available to us to educate ourselves. There's the internet, 
There are books, there are magazines, there are, there's just a wealth of information. There's advisors like myself. I mean, it's pretty easy, I think, for someone to educate themselves as to what their choices are. But on the sa at the same time, I think that it's a great idea to allow people the choice also if they don't want to take that responsibility. If they say, you know what, I'm really conservative, I'd rather not take responsibility, let the government continue to do what they're doing. And right. that's fine. Well, that's exactly the concept that I'm asking Congress to think about. One of the things that um, uh, that people have got to understand is, like in the Federal Thrift Savings Plan, there there is there, there, the, the options are relatively limited. In other words, you can't go out and create your own uh, notion about what you want to invest in. The, the government says, here, if you want to take some of your own money, here's a variety of options, and you know, mainly bonds mainly stocks, a mix of bonds and stocks. And the truth of the matter is, if, when you're younger, you may want to take a little risk. I presume you say to younger people, take a little risk. When you're sure. older, kind of Absolutely. I mean, down it's, on it's, the risk. It's always an, in, on an individual basis, obviously, but younger people can definitely afford to take more risk, and compound interest works for you. And you're better off putting a dollar in yesterday as opposed to two dollars tomorrow yeah. because of that. Good. Well, thanks for coming. My pleasure. Appreciate you being here. Brian Smart. Yes, sir. How are you? Feeling pretty good, yeah. <laughs> how about you? Uh, good. good. Okay, thanks for coming. I understand you just got a job? Uh, yes, which my parents, mom and dad and sister. They must be thrilled. They were very yeah. happy about Very happy. Well, congr <laughs> congratulations. And uh, are you paying payroll taxes yet? Yes. Yeah, you are. Yes, a lot of them. More and, than you realize, right? <clears throat> yeah, I, it's, it's a scary thing. I mean, I, I graduated from Radford University. I graduated this December, so relatively new, and got a job, and I'm out there making money, and this is kind of something that's come up to my attention that yeah. it's not going to be there, and it's something that really it, It's like that bite out of the check. First time that happened, got, got your attention? Well, I mean, it's got my attention previously, but it's, it's something that I'm realizing now that I'm, it's, and I'm not doing anything. I'm paying into something that I can't even use, and there's nothing I'm going to be able to do with it when I retire. Yeah, see, it's kind of a, it's kind of a sad thought, isn't it? The government has got a system now that has evolved away from something that worked really well. Franklin Roosevelt created something that worked well. It's working well when there's 15 workers for every beneficiary, and slowly but surely over time, as a result of demographic change, promises we made we cannot keep. You got a 23-year-old guy, got his first job, saying he's nervous about the system. Government, ought to, government at the very minimum, ought to earn the trust of the people. He trusts. Keep <laughs> going. Well, I mean, so you've been paying attention to this issue when you were in college? A little bit. Tell me the truth, yeah. No, be honest, no. Yeah. I haven't. <laughs> but, I mean, it's something that to me, I've seen firsthand with my grandmother. She's, she's retired, living the life I'd love to live. And, you know, she, her and my grandfather invested wisely when they were young in stocks. And right now, she's basically living off her dividends. She doesn't count on Social Security, yeah. which is something that scares me because she's already at retirement. Right. It's something I have 40, 50 years before, you know, it even, I even start drawing Social Security. Well, there's an, your, your grandma made some wise, your grandfather made some wise choices. There's some people in this country that's all they depend upon is their Social Security check. And it's really important that uh, those folks know that they're going to continue to get their check. And there are a lot of people that the only check they live on is a Social Security check, which, as you can imagine, when they start hearing people talking about reforming the system, they're really thinking, well, maybe my check's going to go away, and people got to know it's not. It's just not going to go away. Government will never do that to people. But I'm not so sure you're going to have a check. And, and that's, that's something, as a 23-year-old person who's paying into Social Security now, really scares me. I hope because so. I, don't, I mean, I don't know enough. You know, I don't really know enough right now to, you know, try to make a decision. And I'm hoping you can guide you in the right direction and well, tell me this is what you need to I, do. I'll tell you, I'll give you a hint. In 2041, the system goes bankrupt. <laughs> that's not very long. I know. It's and long for me and old Ben. That seems like ages, doesn't it? That's a long time. Yeah, but not for him. No, not long. Well, the Do you remember when you were 23? Extremely vividly. I remember when I was here at Blair High School at 17 and 16. But, you know, <laughs> his, 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 his grandparents hitched their wagon to a star, which was the star of investing in stocks and bonds, and it worked incredibly well. The idea of allowing all Americans, not just well-to-do or even upper-middle-class ones, to hitch their wagon to that star makes total sense. Why should we say to or the ordinary citizen, look, because you're not rich, 
you can't get in on the same kind of investment opportunities that rich people can get in on. Let's let everybody get in on it. Let's get everybody get a chance to make some real money. The, the, the Standard & Poor's Index compounded at a rate, I know you don't like statistics, but 14% 14, 14 a year from 1926 to 2004. If you could have your Social Security or even a quarter of it or a fifth of it compound at that rate instead of at 1.8% a year, the difference would be astronomical, astronomical. Yeah, I, I, I do like statistics. <laughs> okay, sorry. Just not too many of them. Okay. <laughs> but I like more, even more than statistics is the notion of an ownership society. We want more people owning something. You know, Brian said something, he, says, he basically turned, he said, I hope you old guys fix it. <laughs> and uh, we have an obligation to fix it. I think there's a lot of younger folks sitting around saying, well, I'm, you know, one, I don't, don't care, I'm not paying attention to it. When they start paying attention to it, realize there's a problem. And they're going to say, well, you know, surely the people we sent to Washington will, will do something to, to permanently fix it. Surely there's a good, enough goodwill in the nation's capital that people set aside their political parties and come together and permanently solve this problem. Surely they're not going to let us pay money into a bankrupt system. I hate to tell you, unfortunately, some are playing politics in Washington. But we're going to keep working it and keep working it and keep calling upon the people. Go ahead. Well, this is, this is something that, I mean, I appreciate you bringing this to my attention because, I mean, I don't know anyone else out there, but I really had no idea. Up until a couple of years ago, this is something I'd never heard of and never even thought that Social Security right. would be completely gone by the time I'm ready to retire. And I appreciate you guys because if it wasn't for what you guys are doing, this whole production and letting people our age and my age know that this is an issue, I, I, wouldn't, even, I wouldn't even really care about it. Like when you were sitting in the library reading all, uh, reading all those books, would, would you ever think about sitting on the stage with the president? <laughs> no, not at all. Yeah. How about the library part? Was that fiction? Uh, that was fiction. Yeah. Yes, that was fiction. I know what you mean. <laughs> ben Ferguson. Howdy. You claim you were from Mississippi. I'm not Mississippi. one of those two Mississippi guys. You are from Mississippi where? Well, Memphis, but I got to school at Ole Miss. Oh, Ole Miss. Very yeah. good, yeah. yeah. There we go. I'm glad there's one. <laughs> uh, so why are you here? Uh, Come I am... all the way from Ole Miss. Uh, I got together with some students. We started an organization called Students for Saving Social Security. Really? Uh, because we realized that basically our second chance at Social Security, the only chance we ever have to have this is if it gets fixed and we get our personal accounts. That's the only way we're going to get it. We know it's not there. We know we're paying someone money that we're not going to see. And so we need our second chance. And, that's, the, and that's the only way we're going to get it. I mean, besides if we win Ben Stein's money, but he told me there's not enough. So <laughs> Pretty good line. Yeah, I mean... <laughs> Uh, so how did you get involved in the Social Security issue? It's, a, it's pretty interesting well, it's, that it's, you would pick up on the issue and decide to do something about it. I, I think a lot of young people in America are tired of politicians always talking about them, saying we need to do this for the children, we need to do this for young people. We want to be listened to. We want to have an option with our future. And, and we've been told our entire lives by both sides of the aisle. You know, whoever's in office, they're both telling us, who, you know, whoever can win from it, it's going bankrupt. I believe them. I believe that it's going to go bankrupt, so fix it because I'm tired of giving my money to somebody that's never going to give it back. And, and, and I think that's why young people, when they get informed, because it is scary at first when you talk about personal accounts, people say, well, is the government going to give you kids their money and they get to go and spend it at the bar on Friday night? No, but we have a choice now. I mean, and the other thing is, is when you realize, when you start paying that money out, the government's giving you a 1.6% return on your investment if you get it. And knowing that, there's not a bank or an institution that would stay in business for a day if that was what they were offering their clients. That's right. And why on earth should we allow them to do that to us? You're on a roll. Keep going. I'm... <laughs> See, I've so, been a little, one of the dynamics of this issue is the people that are, the people that benefit from Social Security Day have nothing to worry about. You notice I keep saying that. In my line of work, you've got to say the same thing over and over and over again, finally get it to sink in. And, but one of the dynamics uh, on the, the issue is that there's a lot of folks out there who need to pay attention to it who might not be paying attention to the issue, and therefore members of uh, the Senate and the House aren't hearing from younger Americans. 
And so part of the goal is to remind people that if you get in your check, you're going to get your check. But if you've got a child coming up, you better start asking the politicians what they're going to do about your, your child or your grandchild. And, and part of it is we want a better America. And I think all young people want a better America, and they want to have a better place to live when they grow older. And if you can infect my generation with actually paying attention instead of being like a bunch of guinea pigs where you just do it for us, and we get to actually make a choice about where money is going to go, the chances that I'm going to look at that statement and go, wow. I'm saving money and I'm making money. Maybe I should take a little bit more out of my check and do it myself. You could infect an entire generation to take care of themselves instead of it depending on the government to take care of them. And I think that's what we all want. Good idea. What, what, what Ben, who I suspect someday soon be sitting where you're sitting, what Ben is saying is that there is uh, there's got to be a revolution of individual responsibility in this country. We cannot just depend on Absolutely. the big hand of Uncle Sam to take care of us. And what we've got to say to Uncle Sam is we're going to accept some of the responsibility. We're going to take a little bit of the money out of our Social Security. We're going to invest it carefully. And from that, we're going to learn to invest generally because it is true Social Security is what a lot of people depend on as their primary livelihood, but it only supplies something like 40 percent of the livelihood for the ordinary retired American. He and she are going to have to start saving more in the private sector anyway. Let's let the private sector Absolutely. spread all over and do its good work in terms of producing wealth for all Americans. Let's not let it just do it for rich people at the country club. Yeah, that's why I want to repeat what I said earlier. I, I, I believe in ownership. I want people from all walks of life every background saying this is mine i own this i'm gonna i'm gonna work my life i'm gonna own this asset i'm gonna pass it on to whomever i want to pass That's it right. on to the more ownership there is in america the better our future is the more people can say this is my stake this is my home my business my retirement fund my health care account the more people say i own this the more solid the future of america will be you got something else to say? Just, that was my pirouation. Well, okay, well, no, no I was just going to say it is a basic fact of both political and economic life that societies that have a state in which the ordinary citizen feels he has a stake in the society and isn't just a ward of the state, isn't just a straw in the right. wind blown about right. by the state, are societies that last a long time. And we want this society to last forever, and it will if we have an ownership society. Absolutely. And, and, Go ahead, yeah. No, I, I, and two, one thing is I want to let you know, and, and, and there's been a lot of people that have said in the media that young people just don't care. We started our organization two months ago. We have over a hundred college campuses, chapters that have said we want to be involved in this That's debate. Good. Thank you. Young people care, and I want to say thank you to you for actually listening to us instead of talking about us. Well, I appreciate you. If you're interested, I'm sure you got a web page. People interested in the issue can... Yes. Uh, you, want me, you want me to plug it? Well, yeah. You got to... <laughs> you got secure Secureourfuture.org. Like there you yeah. go. It's like marketing one, right? <laughs> That's right. I'll, Try I'll it give again. you some money Secure later. Secureourfuture.org. Right. There you go. So people can get on the web page, yep. figure out how to help. Start a campus chapter, in get involved, and be yeah. heard. My final point is, where's a guy get a pair of shoes like that? Uh, you can get them at a place called Front Runners. <laughs> Never mind. In Listen, thank you all for coming. God bless.